Want to know how elite tax advisors win the due diligence game to satisfy ultra high net worth clients who expect the very best? Welcome to the Due Diligence Project Podcast, where you get a chance to learn from the elite CPAs, virtual family office professionals and tax specialists who are doing just that. We'll uncover their insider secrets on how they are dominating their competition, vetting new ideas and supercharging their due diligence process to deliver extraordinary results. Bringing his 25 plus years of experience with top tax professionals across the country, please welcome your host, Alex Sunkin. Good day and welcome to the Due Diligence Project podcast. We are so excited to to have today's guest, a good friend and world-class resource, Mr. Roy Farmer, who is the top ESOP specialist in the country, part of the Virtual Family Office Hub, part of the Due Diligence Project. Roy comes to us with tremendous, tremendous experience taking companies public, um, a leader in corporate finance, using ESOPs, being creative with ESOPs for his own companies. And of course, now he's taken that wisdom and, and sharing it with business owners around the country. Uh, we are going to dive into Roy's head a little bit today and find out what makes him tick, um, how he's serving elite, elite, ultra high net worth business owners and differentiating himself from his competition. Roy, welcome. Welcome to the podcast, my friend. Good morning, Alex. Thank you for having me today. It is. I love seeing you, the background of your office. Uh, tell us where you're, where you're broadcasting from. Well, I, uh, after I sold my last company, uh, which was in California, I bought a cattle ranch in Idaho, and that's where I live. So when I have an office day or when I'm home for the weekend, uh, I'm up here. And this is, uh, you know, this is, I call it my psychologist because uh, being up here and being out with nature and being out on the ranch is, is good therapy for me. It always is. I, I love it. Um, looks really, really cool. And uh, one day I'm going to come out and visit. And we, you know, we got a farm in Wisconsin. And when I get out there, I feel really, really productive, middle of nowhere, very, very quiet. I just go upstairs and get, and get a lot of great work done. Um, great that's, to connect with you what today. Do, that's what I do, but I'm downstairs. So it's the same, same kind of arrangement. Yep. There you go. Well, let's, let's get into this. Um, you know, can you briefly describe what you do, the kind of people you serve, and the kind of situations they find themselves in when they come to you for help? Well, great. Maybe it would be helpful also to explain our affiliation with Capstone Headwaters. Sure. So about, I don't know, eight or nine months ago now, uh, Capstone Headwaters, which is the largest middle market M&A firm in the country on transaction sizes under $250 million and under $100 million, uh, we joined them as their exclusive ESOP group. They, they have not had an ESOP capability in the past. They have 160 investment bankers spread throughout 19 offices in the U.S., and they have representation in 40 foreign countries. So they're, they're quite large, and that gave us access to some very important Wall Street firms. But that's, that's a little bit about our affiliation with them. We're a division of Capstone. Uh, in terms of our market and who we serve, um, basically there are a lot of baby boomers out there. And I think most of your audience probably knows the statistics. And the baby boomers are the ones that over the years have accumulated business interest in, in everything from the corner drugstore to multinational billion dollar corporation. Now, some of those will go to their family members. Some will be sold to a private equity or another other investor. But those that want to do a, a transition to their employees and retain control of the company and be able to continue to be a part of the company without reporting to someone else, uh, they are attracted to an ESOP. And those clients run from businesses from $10 million in, in business value up to, you know, the biggest one I've done is $400 million. We've looked at some five and $600 million companies. So we work pretty much on anything up, up into including, you know, five, six hundred million dollars. Now, now and, how did you, how did you get involved in ESOPs? I mean, it, t talk to me about, you weren't originally an ESOP provider, right? You were, you were in corporate finance. Right. I, I, out of college, I went to work for an investment bank in San Francisco. I worked for their, them for 10 years. I became a president of one of their divisions and we were doing just, you know, all kinds of different corporate financial uh, activities. 
activities and analysis and whatnot. And that company ended up selling to a commercial bank. That was right after Glass-Steagall was repealed. And uh, everybody thought, oh boy, now that the, the, the dam has been broken, we should all become you know, investment bankers. And they bought our company, and unfortunately, the bank really didn't understand investment banking. I left. I started one small company on my own that I ultimately sold to my partner. Then I was brought in as a chief financial officer of a mid-stage startup company in, in the Bay Area. And I ended up becoming the CEO, recapitalized the company, and uh, ended up selling it to a division of waste management, the garbage company. Mm. Then I started another company with some, with some partners. Um, and it was a general engineering and general environmental services firm. And we did an ESOP in that company. And it worked out very well. It, it did pretty much as advertised and as we needed. And so ultimately, I, I sold my interest in that company. And at a young age, 42, I retired. I bought this ranch. And that's how I end up out here on the ranch and expected kind of to stay retired. But as I tell people, I failed at retirement. I mean, I, I learned that, you know, being out on the ranch is great and I love it. And it's a great, you know, I love to do it for even a two or three or four weeks at a time if I have that much time to give, but which lately it's been very busy. But I just decided that retirement really wasn't what I wanted to do. So I, I, I got a call from one of my clients that kind of became the catalyst. And I ended up helping them do a $125 million ESOP. And I met a, a, a part, my partner, my current partner, Fred Thomas, he was with a firm at that time called Marshall and Stevens. And then he ultimately asked me to come to work with him. And I did for about four or five years. And then we decided to go off on our own and start our current company, Business Transition Advisors. And he and I still own, each own 50% of it. And we, we work in the middle market. We work on referral primarily. Yeah. So we work with CPAs, attorneys, we work with bankers, financial advisors, we work with trust companies and trust officers, and we work with insurance professionals and independent uh, brokerage firms, and of course, we work with the big brokerage firms, Merrill Lynch, uh, UBS, Morgan Stanley, they give us referrals, and then we meet with clients and discuss their transition uh, options, and of course, most of them don't know much about ESOPs, and it's, those have been some very productive discussions for us. Well, I could tell you, you know, we, we, we've interviewed quite a few ESOP specialists. I've had, a, I've had the pleasure of working with four different ESOP groups. Um, so you, you know, be, being part of the due diligence project, many, many CPA firms and family offices told us about you. Uh, we did our due diligence with you. But when I started working with you, I remember our first meeting, and I remember going into client meetings with you, it was very, very clear that you were very unique from all the other providers that we've ever seen before. The creativity, I think the fact that you came from corporate finance, the fact that you actually used an ESOP for your own companies, uh, and also just your creativity of using ESOP with other strategies in combination to really custom design uh, solutions for the business owner. Because this in many situations, this is like the biggest transaction that the business owner is going to make in his entire life. Am I right there? And, and he only has one chance to get it right. Yeah. So, so going with, you know, number two, number three, number four, trying to find a, a you know, just someone local or someone low cost, you know, may be the most expensive mistake of someone's life. Um, you know, our CPA firms, our family offices, they are not in the business of taking risk uh, with their biggest clients, especially when it comes to the most important transaction of their clients' lives. And so this re it's really important for us, just like if a family has a sick baby, let's not find the, the you know, a local doctor. Let's find the best specialist in the world to help heal this baby. Um, that's so important for our community to have the best ESOP resource out there. And so we're just, we're just really grateful to have you part of us. Can you get into, you know, what, what is the biggest challenge and, and fears that your client, you know, I know the challenge is, okay, I, I'm trying to get, exit. I want to get, get my company, the employees, or I might have a large tax uh, situation that maybe an ESOP is going to take care of. So those are some of the challenges, but what are some of the fears going into in their, your client's minds as they come to you to potentially looking at an ESOP? Well, one, one is, do, do they really understand it? 
And back to a point you made just a second ago, our, our secret sauce, if there really is one, uh, is a couple of things. But one of them is we have an ability, and we've, over the last 20 years, our presentation material, including our, our most favored way to present an ESOP to a client, is on a whiteboard. Because when you do PowerPoint, which it seems to be all the rage, you, you have to cut it up into little snippets. Yeah. So you start at the beginning, you show a slide, you have two or three nuggets of information on it, then you go to the next one, and finally 50 slides later, you're at the end. Well, the problem is the client doesn't always remember what you talked about in the beginning, and sometimes they get clearly get mm. confused. Now, we have that same problem with our PowerPoint. But that's why we like to use this whiteboard. And you can put the whole thing on one whiteboard. The client can see the entire ESOP process. And if they if they look, they want to look back and say, okay, oh, yeah, I remember. There was a loan there that started this whole thing. They can see it on that board. So we, we have that ability, I think. Most of our clients, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've walked into meetings. Recently, I just did a large ESOP for about $165 million company up in the Anaheim area, and they had hired, like a lot of people do, they hired three people to come in and make a presentation, three different companies. Mm -hmm. And frankly, they were both, uh, the other two companies were technically pretty good. They, they understood how to do an ESOP, and I think if the client had selected them, they would have done a, a decent job. But they're, they're staffed by accountants and attorneys and people who really try to make this stuff complex. Yeah. And, and I came in, I was the last of the three presenters, and I came in and I did our whiteboard presentation. Mm -hmm. And I had the two key owners there, they were the older owners, both in their 70s, and I had their three sons in the meeting because they owned the majority of the stock. There were some employee stockholders that owned little bits and pieces here and there, but they were the ones that own way more than the majority, so they were going to make the decision. And I, I did my whiteboard presentation, and I got all done, and I thanked them, and I said, love to work for you. I think we could do exactly what you're trying to accomplish, and we've done it many times with construction companies all over the country, some as big as yours and some smaller, and a couple of them that were larger. And I, I, I think we're very comfortable in this space and happy to help you. So I stood up and I grabbed the eraser and I walked over to the whiteboard and as I did, the, the two older owners jumped out of their chairs and said, "Don't, what are you doing? Don't erase that board. And I said, well, guys, I mean, nobody else will understand this and I know this is your, your conference room, so somebody may come in behind us and I don't think I'd leave that up there. And they said, well, that's okay, but let us take a picture of it. I said, well, this is the first time we've really ever understood an ESOP. So, I mean, I get that response all the time. And it, we, we make the complicated simple. And it's like anything else. When you do it every day, like, like for your CPA, when they explain how to do cost segregation or some other, you know, concept to a client, then it, it, they, they make it sound easy and they make it sound simple because they understand it backwards and forwards and inside and out. If you, if you don't have that knowledge, it may sound a little screwy or a little difficult or complex, but that's, that's where we shine is working in that area. The other thing I would say is that as you talk about cost, I mean, we try to be very competitive cost-wise, but our biggest strength is, is that we have uh, an, an ability to, to get into the value drivers of a company. Mm -hmm. So recently, and I can't tell you the name of the company, uh, but we, I had a client who told me, uh, I got to get $60 million for my company. And it was a construction-related business. And we said, well, we don't think that's going to be a problem. And, and he said, well, I, he said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, we're relatively confident what the way, you know, what we understand about your business. And I sent my evaluator over there, spent two days with him and his management. And we all agreed internally that, yeah, we can get this. We, we ended up with a $90 million purchase price. Mm. So, I mean, that's, that's not common. I mean, not to see that large of a spread, but typically our clients don't really don't pay anything for our services. Because let's, let's say a, a client says, I think my company's worth $50 million or $20 million, whatever the number is. And once we look at it, it's not uncommon to get an extra 2 or 3 or $4 million 
for the company by the way we understand the business. And I've got a valuator who's got, you know, 30 years of experience. And my partner, Fred, has got, I think it's pretty much coming up on 40 years of experience now. So they understand valuation backwards and forwards. And, and we get in there and really look at the company, uh, do whatever we have to, 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 you know, make sure the books and records are cleaned up. And, you know, from an accounting point of view, it's all the company looks as good as it, as it can. We're not trying to, to you know, fool anyone because the, the trustees that we have to negotiate with on an ESOP, they're very sophisticated and they have their own financial advisor. But we, we've made sure that books and records as much as possible uh, reflect the true operations of the company. We look at ad backs and we, you know, sometimes there has to be a quality of earnings or other things done. But typically we're going to get a, that client an extra few million dollars for the business. So, if, so, so if you're going to, so, so let's, so you're able to create a lot more, you know, you're able to use your expertise in corporate finance, utilizing this very co- complicated instrument that you are now, you know, the leading expert in the country. And, and very fluent in, in, in maneuvering the structure to actually increase the sales price for the seller. Is it? Right. That's what we try to do in every. We try to do that. Now, what, what else? What, uh, let, let's give us an example, you know, without going into too much detail of a client comes to you and you're able to, you know, take us through an example. You were able to increase all the benefits that you were able to provide them. Maybe there's also estate planning, income tax mitigation, enhanced valuation, all the stuff that you're doing uh, on the back end without too much detail, but just give us an example of, of some of the work you've done. Right. Well, I, I, I'll give you this recent company uh, in Anaheim. Uh, yeah. when, when, we met, when we met with the owners and met with, and by the way, his, his uh, CFO was formerly his, with his CPA firm. And this guy was a CPA and he had a master's in tax. So he was pretty sharp. And one of the sharper CFOs that we would work with. Um, when we went in, we originally thought, without doing a lot of due diligence, the company would, would sell for around 118 to $120 million. And the CFO said, well, you know, after we made our presentation of our value, he said, well, my, my numbers were a little over $100 million. So he said, you guys are definitely in the ballpark. If you can get that kind of value, um, you know, you're going you're gonna to earn everything, every penny we pay to you. We ended up getting around $140 million. Wow. Now, a good thing that happened was the client's financial performance uh, happened to increase nicely. That helped us. But even then, you know, our $120 million was a little bit low. So that was, that was one thing. In, in that case, we got him, you know, I think we got a loan from, Wells Fargo for about $42 million. So they were able to spread around some of the cash. They took a seller note for a portion of it at a, at a reasonable interest rate. Um, they were going to make millions just on the interest on that note over the period that it was going to be held. Um, we, we would save them in taxes because they sold 100% of the stock and became state and federal income tax free. Over the first 10 years of the plan, we would save them about 250 million dollars in state and federal income tax, assuming they just met their projection. Mm. Now, obviously, some clients fall short, some clients exceed them, but we, we normally, we really make sure those projections are fairly conservative. In addition to that, the owners were able to qualify for the 1042 benefit. Mm. I'm not sure when the dust all cleared, because that's not a piece of the transaction that we physically do. We help coordinate it, but we don't and for our listeners, can you expound on, on the 1042 benefit? What the, what does that mean to the novice out there? Well, for the novice, and it's easy. We're, your clients in the in the ZFO hub are very sophisticated. They are. And so they're going to understand this quickly. Sure. Uh, basically, they all know what a 1042 is. And when you own real estate, if you don't want if you want to sell it and not pay current state or federal capital gains tax, you you do you follow the Starker rules. You hire a facilitator. You do an exchange, and you complete a 1031 exchange out of the code, and you don't pay any current state or federal income tax. Now, the negative is, if you ever sell it, you have to pay the tax, and you have a carryover basis. But currently, you you pay no state or federal income tax. Well, ESOPs are favored in much the same way. 
It's mm -hmm. called Section 1042 of the code. It's just down a little bit from 1031. It's in the code, the area of the code where all of the tax-free exchanges are included. And in an ESOP, an owner, and again, there are, there are qualifications. We have to look at whether a client actually qualifies. I, I can't really, I mean, there's a bunch, we could take a half an hour just on that. But basically, if a client qualifies, they can sell their company stock to a qualified ESOP, and then they can qualify for this 1042 by filing certain tax forms with the government. And they buy stock sponsor notes of U.S. domestic companies, and they can pay no current state or federal capital gains tax. So that's what a 1042 is. I don't know. We, we estimated they were going to save $37 million just in the capital gains tax. I don't know when, when the dust cleared and they all have to work with their own individual financial advisors. I'm not sure what the exact final number was, but it's going to be in that $37 million range. So, I mean, wow. You know, it, wow. That's a lot of benefit um, for the client. I'm sure the clients were ecstatic. I mean, this is why you're here. You know, this is why you're part of the due diligence project. This is why you're part of our best in class peer reviewed community of resources. Um, the other thing we really love about you is it, not that you bring massive value and you bring and you explain this in such a clear way that really is important for, as a bedside manner for these business owners who, who are not technical experts in financial instruments. What we really appreciate about you is these backroom conversations that we have at our events um, when we can pick your brain and pick the brain of our top captive guys and our top uh, attorneys, tax attorneys, our top charitable planning specialists and see how when we build this, you know, when we get together, it's like an all-star game, like an NBA all-star game. You have the best of class, all these different resources working together, having these hallway conversations. Being a part of these conversations, I have learned an incredible amount, and our community has learned an incredible amount. And when we extract that and share that with our elite CPAs and family offices, their confidence and their knowledge goes up very, very quickly. So can you talk a little bit about your participation uh, as a thought leader with the, the other thought leaders and specialists as part of the due diligence project? One of the things that most people are not aware of is that an ESOP can be used in a state planning application. So many times our clients really didn't know what their company was worth. They probably didn't do a very a complete job of estate planning if they did any estate planning at all. I have a client I'm meeting with the next next month in Los Angeles and the two, the two owners, it's a billion dollar company and neither of them have done any estate planning. And they're both, one's 83 and one's 84. So, you know, when you can show them on an ESOP how to how to reduce the value of the either the taxable gift or reduce the value of the estate so that the estate taxes are less, because in this case, these owners aren't going to escape estate taxes. They're going to have to pay. But if we can cut it from, you know, whatever that might be, $200 million or $300 million to $100 million or $150 million, we've, we've just done a, a great job for our clients. So that's one thing that we talk to our clients about. We don't do estate planning, but we work with their estate planning attorneys to make sure that the ESOP is structured in such a way that it can maximize the estate planning benefit to them if they, if they need it. And, and there are certain structures, complicated structures that we can really use that, that, that do work, and we've used them over the years. And this, this all came to us from a gentleman whose name is Nick Leosi, and Nick has passed away. He was an attorney in a boutique law firm in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. Um, he, uh, he was president of the Florida Bar tax, uh, tax section for many years, and he was also the, the national president of the Association of Accountants. It's a county, I think they call them attorney CPA. So you have to have a dual designation, and he was their president. Um, and he, he came up with all of this, and we vetted it through a, a number of other attorneys, and it's, it's been something we've used for, I don't know, eight or nine years, I guess. The other yeah. thing, uh, in, a, in, a, in, this, in this one case we talked about, the client had a very large brokerage account. So they had a lot of cash, and they kept their work, they really managed their working capital well. They did have a line of credit, but they hardly ever used it. But they had so much excess cash that they had about $5 million in a brokerage account. Now, obviously, that brokerage account is taken into account on the valuation, but the thing that 
that we learned as we got into it is they had about $2 million in gain in the brokerage account that they were going to have to pay tax on. And so we, we, we came to them and we said, look, don't sell the brokerage account now and use it, use the cash to fund the, uh, so. the uh, transaction because you're going to have to, the company or, or you, I, I don't remember exactly who owned it, you're going to have to pay the tax. So what we did is we said, just leave it intact. Let's leave it as a company asset. Let's wait until you become 100% tax-free. Then you can liquidate the brokerage account, and that $2 million of gain comes out with no tax. So that, that was one thing we did in that transaction. Another thing that we, we use quite often, and I'm giving away all my secrets, but uh, let's assume we have a company that's got a lot of fixed assets, a manufacturing company or maybe a big construction company where you've got lots of, you know, I call it yellow iron, and, and you're buying Caterpillar tractors and loaders and dump trucks. And, and you decide you want to do the CSOP. Now, you can spin out some of the equipment, but what we rec recommend the, the client do is, look, at just start a new company. You could probably make it an LLC. You got to talk to your tax advisor to find out what would be the best structure and what you want. You can own it. Your family can own it. You can cut your key people in on it if you want. And when the company in the future buys new equipment, because once the company is tax-free, it no longer needs depreciation. It's just wasted. So take the, buy the equipment, and as long as you do it at fair market value, and don't mark it up and try to make a profit on it more than what a leasing company would do. Buy the equipment in your own company, take the depreciation, and then lease it to the company at fair market value. Company doesn't need the depreciation. It's See, this is this, this is what you I'm talking about. For your own, own taxes. See, this is what I'm talking about. This is super creative. And what I'm talking about is when you have the top ESOP guy, the top captive guy, the top tax attorneys, the top charitable planning guys, and you have a CPA who's got a client who's got a big tax problem or a need or wants to sell a company, where do we go? What's the first step? Well, we first have to understand what's possible with an ESOP. And we can't do that when we work with, a, with a, you know, the average ESOP provider. So when we work with the top ESOP provider and have him have a conversation with the top captive guy, with the top tax attorneys, and look at the entire structure and try to poke holes in where do we start? Is this an ESOP? Is it a captive? Can we combine? Oh, he's already got a captive. Can we combine the ESOP and the captive? See, these are the conversations when a CPA is on their own. Where do they call? Who do they call to, to find the thought leaders in all these different areas so they can analyze all this information and then call their client and say, this is the best combination of solutions that we've come up with or here are all the possible solutions and we think this one is the best because of these pieces. To get someone like you in a room with all of our other resources and be able to have that conversation very, very efficiently creates massive confidence for the CPA. And when the CPA or elite family office leader is confident, then they could deliver massive value to their clients. And until that CPA or family office leader has that level of confidence, they're not going to make the phone call. And if they don't make the phone call, the client doesn't receive the value. And so what we're seeing is due diligence is really, really hard. And so you being a part of our community gives me tremendous confidence and gives our community tremendous confidence. So I don't know if you realize how important you are to us and how important our community of A plus only resources working together. And look, we're pushing you. Like when you get, you know, Michael Jordan and LeBron James and you know Kobe Bryant, all these people in a room, you know, they're pushing each other. They're showing off their creativity. They, they love being a part of an all-star group. We love having you part of our all-star team. And I don't know if you realize how valuable all of these interactions are because that's really where we create incredible, unique value for our CPAs. Where they, where else can they go to meet the top A plus players in all these different areas? Because you know, twenty years ago, you could just go to Goldman Sachs. They're all working at Goldman Sachs, but they don't work at Goldman Sachs anymore, right? How much money would Goldman Sachs have to pay you to be a W two employee for Goldman Sachs? Uh, I, I don't know, but. But my problem is, it's just like I talk to my clients, Alex. I look at my client and they say, well, I'm, I'm considering a sale to private equity. And I look at them and I say, look, I've been a business owner. I've started four companies, uh, sold three of them, still own one, the one I, I own, BPA. 
And, and I said, I will tell you that I would be an awful employee. And can you really work for somebody else? Because if you sell this thing to a private equity fund no. or to a, you know, some sort of a strategic buyer, e- either you're going to lose your job or you're going to want to quit because you're not going to want to report to anybody. And the big advantage of an ESOP for many of these owners is I can show you how to retain control after the sale, even if you sell 100%, and I can show you how you can continue to still run the company. And if you, know, if you decide that you want to retire, you can retire on your own terms. And if you want to just, just be the chairman or the executive chairman and get paid $100,000 a year and come into the company and run the board meetings and be a consultant and make you know answer questions and be available to consult with the management team, most of which you probably know and have mentored on the way up, we can do that. The, the ESOPs are so flexible in that regard. But the one thing is the owner never, never has to report to somebody else. And, that, and that's it. a no. big thing. Well, you know, ES- you, you know ESOPs better than anyone I've ever met. You are creative with them. And that I think that the solution is not the ESOP. The solution is someone who is so creative, knowing it backwards and forwards, being able to implement it properly and custom design the benefits that the client wants and be able to have that confidence to understand what it is that they're, they're getting themselves into. That's why we're really excited about you at part of our community. Before we take off, you know, is there something that your clients don't know about you that's interesting that you want to share with, with our audience who's watching this? Well, program? no, I, I don't, well, I don't know, Alex. I mean, I'm, I'm married uh, to the same woman. We're going to celebrate our 47th wedding anniversary in April uh, coming up. Real soon, I actually I got to figure out what I'm going to do because as you get closer to 50, you know you got to got to step up, right? Got to step but your game up. We we got a great family. We have five children, um, and uh, you know we live out. I live out here on the ranch, and uh, we travel as much as we can. And of course, I travel for business a lot, but I I enjoy meeting with clients. And the, the and this is something probably people don't know, but the the most fun that I have in any one day is to stand up in front of 150 or 200 employees and explain to them that they are now going to be a part of an ESOP. And the chances are we just impacted 150 or 200 lives. And instead of retiring with social security and a small 401k, and and as you know, a lot of the blue collar workers don't even participate in the 401k. There are 50% of Americans that own stock. Most of them own stock through their 401k, but the other 50% own nothing, and they're going to retire with just Social Security. And we all know that that's, that's I, I don't know what the right description is, a dead end would probably be, be a good description because you're going to struggle and you're going to be in the, in the pocket of the government who's going to give you handouts for the rest of your life. But with an ESOP, they, they will, the studies have shown that you lay two companies side by side. One's an ESOP, one's not. And after 30 years, the ESOP company has two to 300% more retirement benefits than the standalone 401k. Now, many of our owners keep the 401k, so the employees get that benefit. And they add the ESOP on top of it, and so it can be a four or 500% increase in what a retirement benefit that, it, that, it, that an individual might have. And, you know, when... Take Winco Foods. They're a large ESOP. They're growing. They're becoming more uh, popular in terms of name recognition. They have about 17,000 employees, and they're growing. They're the fourth largest ESOP in America. But the studies have shown that if you work there 20 or 25 years, and you retire, and you've been a cashier, and you've made 13, 14 bucks an hour, you're going to have one and a half to two million dollars in your ESOP account. So you're going to be in a position where instead of with your handout to the government, you're going to be paying taxes, no doubt about it, because we have to pay taxes on our retirement account. But you're also going to have enough money that you, if you're, you know, if you're careful uh, with Social Security, you, you could probably have a pretty nice retirement. And that's what that's to me is, is the best part of my job. I love it. I love it. Listen. Roy, thank you so much for uh, investing some time with us. Um, I think our audience got a lot out of this. I think we they understand why you're part of the due diligence project, why you're one of our best in class peer reviewed resources, and we're we're just glad to have you part of our team. Thank you so much for being part of it. And um, listen, enjoy enjoy Idaho, enjoy your ranch up there. Um, 
And uh, we'll talk soon, my friend. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alex. Have a great day. You too. That's all for this episode of the Due Diligence Project Podcast. Be sure to visit diligenceproject.com to access the resources we have available for qualified CPAs and family office leaders. Our mission at the Due Diligence Project is to help you deliver more significance and value to your very best clients while shifting your traditional practice into the firm of the future.